Hello everyone, my name is Vanessa Lagos. I am a PhD student under Dr. Hans Stein, and today I will talk about requirement for digestible calcium at different dietary concentrations of digestible phosphorus indicated by growth performance and bone ash of 50 to 85 kilogram peaks. So let's start with a brief introduction. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. It has important roles in physiological processes such as synthesis and maintenance of bones and regulation of several cellular functions. Calcium is closely related to phosphorus and therefore it influences phosphorus metabolism. Moreover, excess calcium is detrimental to growth. Requirements for calcium has been expressed on the basis of total calcium. First, body phosphorus mass is calculated based on body protein due to the linear relationship between body nitrogen content and body phosphorus content. Then, the requirement for digestible phosphorus is calculated based on the body phosphorus mass and is expressed as a standardized total tract digestible phosphorus or STTD phosphorus. And finally, by multiplying the digestible phosphorus requirement by 2.15, the requirement for total calcium is obtained. So in peaks from 50 to 75 kilograms, the digestible phosphorus requirement is 0.27% and the total calcium requirement is 0.59%. However, it was stated in the NRC that requirements for calcium should be expressed as digestible calcium, but due to a lack of data, that wasn't possible. But late research has provided values for standardized total tract digestible calcium in different feed ingredients using diets without phytase and with phytase, and this is important because of the relationship between calcium and phytate. So having these values, we are able to formulate diets based on digestible calcium and to establish digestible calcium requirements. Indeed, estimates for standardized total tract digestible calcium requirements for peaks from 25 to 50 and 100 to 130 kilograms have been reported. The conclusions of this experiment were that calcium requirements for bone ash are greater than for growth performance, that requirements for calcium should be expressed as a ratio between digestible calcium and digestible phosphorus, and that a ratio greater than 1.40 to 1 may reduce growth performance. So these two experiments leave a gap between 50 and 100 kg peaks. Therefore, the objectives of this experiment were to determine the requirement for standardized total tract digestible calcium in peaks from 50 to 85 kg based on growth performance and bone ash, and to test the hypothesis that the requirement for calcium needed to maximize growth performance expressed as a ratio between digestible calcium and digestible phosphorus is less than 1.35 to 1, and this number comes from previous research and is based on the weight of the peaks. Moving on to the material and methods, 15 corn soybean meal based diets were formulated using three levels of digestible phosphorus from 0.14 to 0.41, representing 50, 100, and 150% of the digestible phosphorus requirement, and five levels of total calcium from 0.18 to 1%, representing 30, 60, 100, 140, and 170% of the requirement for total calcium. We did not include phytase in these diets, so we used the corresponding standardized total tract digestible calcium values of the ingredients included in the diets to calculate the concentration of digestible calcium in the diets. So we end up with 15 different digestible calcium to digestible phosphorus ratios. Here we can observe that as the concentration of calcium increases, the ratio also increases. But as the concentration of phosphorus increases, the ratio decreases. So we have a range from 0.32 to 1 to 4.50 to 1, and the diet with the NRC values have a ratio of 1.41 to 1. We fed these 15 diets to 90 barrows for a total of 6 replicate pigs per diet for 30 days and using initial and final body weight, as well as the amount of feed provided, we calculated growth performance parameters. On day 31, pigs were harvested and the right femur was removed, 
diffarded, dried, and ashed to measure bone characteristics. For the statistical analysis, a second-order surface response model was used. This model includes the linear effect of calcium and phosphorus, the quadratic effect of calcium and phosphorus, and all interactions between linear and quadratic calcium and phosphorus. For all variables, we start using the full model, but if a term or an interaction was not significant, then the model was reduced by removing the non-significant terms. Therefore, you will see some variables with the full model and some variables with a reduced model. And anytime I say calcium, I mean a standardized total tract digestible calcium and the same for phosphorus. Now let's move into the results and let's start with growth performance. This graph shows the average daily feed intake of pigs fed the experimental diets. To set up the slide, in the horizontal axis we have the five levels of digestible calcium and in the vertical axis we have the predicted variable. So as we increase the concentration of calcium, there is a reduction in feed intake regardless of the concentration of phosphorus. This is likely due to the fact that excess calcium may bind phosphorus, making phosphorus less available for pigs. And it was already demonstrated in previous research that phosphorus deficiency is detrimental to feed consumption of growing pigs. In this model, only the linear term of calcium was significant, which indicates that only the amount of calcium in the diet explains the differences in average daily feed intake. For average daily gain, there was an effect of calcium, an effect of phosphorus, and interactions between calcium and phosphorus. So in this graph, and from now on, the green line represents phosphorus below the requirement, the red line represents phosphorus at the requirement, and the orange bar represents phosphorus above the requirement. So if phosphorus is below the requirement, increasing concentration of calcium decreases average daily gain. Now, if phosphorus is supplied at the requirement from the low levels of calcium, there is an improvement in average daily gain, which demonstrates that in these diets, phosphorus is the limiting factor. But again, addition of dietary calcium reduces average daily gain. So there is a detrimental effect of increasing calcium on average daily gain. Now, if phosphorus is above the requirement, there is a reduction in average daily gain compared to phosphorus at the requirement. So it is also likely that excess phosphorus bind calcium and then calcium becomes more limiting than phosphorus. But here, as more calcium is included in the diet, average daily gain increases. So these data are showing the way these two minerals interact and the importance of using calcium to phosphorus ratios in feed formulation. So the predicted maximum response was observed at 0.34% of calcium if phosphorus was at the requirement. This value corresponds to a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 1.25 to 1. However, for phosphorus below and above the requirement, due to the nature of the responses, we could not predict a maximum response. For this variable, the full model was used. For final body weight, a similar pattern to average daily gain was observed. If phosphorus is below the requirement, increasing calcium reduces body weight. If phosphorus is at the requirement, there is also a reduction as calcium is added in the diet. And if phosphorus is above the requirement, increasing calcium improves final body weight. However, in here, the predicted maximum response was observed at 0.33% of calcium if phosphorus was at the requirement. The corresponding calcium to phosphorus ratio was 1.20 to 1. And again, in this variable, the full model was used. For gain to feed ratio, there is a decrease in feed efficiency as dietary calcium increases if phosphorus is below the requirement. No effect of different concentrations of calcium on gain to feed if phosphorus is at the requirement, and an improvement in feed efficiency if phosphorus is above the requirement. This implies that if we use diets that are already high in phosphorus, for example, 
if there is a high concentration of DDGs, we should also increase the concentration of calcium in order to maximize feed efficiency. In this model, only the linear terms were significant, which explains why we could not predict a maximum response. Now let's move into the results for bone characteristics. This graph shows the concentration of bone ash in grams per femur. Here we can observe that at low concentration of calcium, there are small differences among the three levels of phosphorus. But as we increase the concentration of calcium, there is an increase in the concentration of bone ash. Slightly if phosphorus is below the requirement and considerably if phosphorus is at or above the requirement, with no differences between the last two. Now, if we keep increasing the concentration of calcium, we observe that if phosphorus is at the requirement, there is less concentration of bone ash compared to phosphorus above the requirement. So this data show the need of both calcium and phosphorus for bone deposition as well as the way that calcium and phosphorus interact. The predicted maximum response was observed at 0.55% of calcium if phosphorus was at the requirement and 0.65% of calcium if phosphorus was above the requirement, representing a ratio between calcium and phosphorus of 2.0321 and 1.1591 respectively. And I want to point out that the ratio 2.0321 is close to the calcium to phosphorus ratio of 2.121 that is always present in bones. And in this variable, the full model was used. Finally, this is the result for bone ash as percentage of the defarted femur. So in the previous slide, the size of the bone was taken into account, and here is only the proportion of ash in the bone. In this graph, we can observe that increasing concentrations of calcium increase the percentage of ash. However, this variable is dependent on the concentration of phosphorus. So there is a need of both minerals for bone mineralization. We can also observe that the values range from 55% to 61%. So in general terms, these values are close, which indicates that the percentage of bone is maintained constant regardless of the concentration of calcium and phosphorus in the diet. And this was also observed in the concentration of calcium and phosphorus as a percentage of bone ash. In this model, only the linear terms were significant and therefore we could not predict a maximum response. To summarize the results, if phosphorus is at the requirement, the ratio digestible calcium to digestible phosphorus that maximizes growth performance is around 1.23 to 1. This is based on the results for average daily gain and final body weight. And in order to maximize bone mineralization, a ratio around 2 to 1 is needed. This difference means that after the growth performance requirement is met, calcium and phosphorus are used to synthesize more bone tissue. So in conclusion, growth performance is reduced by increasing dietary calcium if phosphorus is at or below the requirement. Maximizing bone ash requires a greater ratio between digestible calcium and digestible phosphorus than growth performance. And peaks from 50 to 85 kilograms require a ratio between digestible calcium and digestible phosphorus of 1.23 to 1 if digestible phosphorus is at the requirement. I would like to acknowledge AB Vista for the financial support and everybody from Dr. Stein Lab. And if you want to learn more about this or other topics, visit our website at nutrition.ansai.illinois. That EDU. Thank you for listening.